The original Star Wars Battlefront games are among the most beloved entries in the video game quadrant of the long-running franchise. If, for whatever reason, you don't know, Battlefront is all about putting you in the boots of soldiers and duking it out on, well, the Battlefront. They are certified classics, with legions of fans just waiting to flood comment sections with nostalgic paragraphs. It's for a good reason too, because these games kicked all sorts of ass, letting fans act out their childhood fantasies of taking part in the galaxy-spanning conflicts across both eras with a multitude of units, vehicles and weapons to play with. All the famous locations were of course present like Hoth, Endor and Geonosis, but there were other maps that were featured in the films but didn't have big battles, like Mustafar and Yavin 4. I mean, there were battles there, but one was just two guys with lightsabers and the other one was just in space way above it. Yes, these games are beloved, and you'll find no shortage of fans still wishing for a proper third entry. I doubt it'll ever happen, but rest assured, I'm there right with you. Unfortunately, I never got to play the PSP games, but I heard they're really good. Maybe I will someday. In 2015, a new Battlefront was announced, developed by DICE and published by EA, with a sequel coming out not long after. While these games bear the name Battlefront, it's really hard to compare them with the originals, just because they're so different. The newer ones are a lot more... what's the word? Arcadey. I still had my fair share of enjoyment, but these seem more focused on unlocks and special perks, and the battles felt a bit more linear. Something I can compare are the two original games, released in 2004 and then 2005, because functionally they are very similar in gameplay and design, but have enough differences between them that I feel a comparison is warranted. So that's what I'm going to be doing here in this video, taking a look at these two games and then comparing them with one another in these key areas. Full disclaimer, I have plenty of nostalgia for these games and I'm not shy about it. Funnily enough, I never actually owned my own copy of Battlefront 1 when growing up. We rented it for a bit when it came out and I enjoyed it for a weekend, but then we had to return it. My cousin had it on his Xbox and I used to play it a few times a month whenever I went at my nan's in Cardiff, but that's it. Back in the day, I played it considerably less than Battlefront 2, which was something I saved up for for months with many trading credits used. Remember GameStation? Yeah, that was where I got it. Bearing that in mind, know that much of my childhood was shaped by many, many hours playing Battlefront 2, while my time with the first game was a bit more fleeting. This doesn't actually have an influence on how I feel about these games today, however, and I want to approach them from a more unbiased perspective. Playing the games close together recently, and even while still writing the script, I was learning new things and having my opinions tugged back and forth. With all that preamble out the way, Let's get to the meat of the video, comparing the two games. Before I go any further, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has watched my previous videos and subscribed. It really means a lot. I've only very recently kicked my channel back into gear and I'm still quite small, so I appreciate all the feedback I can get. If you like what you see or you just enjoy hearing me talk nonsense, then please subscribe if you haven't already. First off, I need to address a big, glaring, stinky issue that 99% of the time across the, both of these games has been spent playing it on single player. Since I didn't have many friends who played it, and trying to find matches recently and stay in them has been a bit of a pain. I understand that this is a game which probably emphasised multiplayer, but sadly I had to contend with bots. For all I know, my upcoming comments about gameplay, map design and other stuff could be rendered completely moot by the fact that I've only ever experienced them by myself. If that's the case, and you were hoping to see a bit more of a multiplayer focused insight, then I apologise. If you're still okay with hearing about everything from the perspective of someone playing on their Todd, then proceed. Secondly, I feel this is kind of unnecessary because it's common sense, but YouTube videos always has this bit. And it's that this is all entirely my own opinion, and I'm not trying to change anyone's mind or present this as fact. It's just me comparing two games that I love very much, and trying to figure out which game I think is better. If you completely disagree with everything I say, then that's fine. I invite you to tell me why. I just have to humbly request that you're not an ass about it and don't call me a cockmongling queefburger. Both games can either be played in either first or third person view. If you're playing on PC like I am, then you can swap between them with a quick key press. But on the console, you've got to go into the options to do it every time. I'm by no means a PC master race person and it's only very recently that I've properly started playing games on my computer, but quick options like this are a godsend not to mention the higher resolution of mod support. Also on that, the Battlefront 2 I've been playing has been using the remastered mod, which updates the textures and replaces some of the models with newer ones. Most of the footage you'll be seeing of Battlefront 2 comes with this mod equipped, but when relevant, I'll put overlays on to show what I'm talking about, for instance, the old unit. Battlefront 1 lets you command your fellow troopers around, giving orders like following you, staying put to hold an area, or just sodding off and doing whatever they want to do. I love gathering a little squad together for a mission behind enemy lines to capture a command post, because doing it by yourself can be difficult. 
If you're good enough, you can just one-man army it, but it's really easy to get overwhelmed or blindsided if you're not careful, so having backup is good. The system isn't super in-depth, and it's possible to ignore it entirely if you want, but I like to immerse myself in these situations in these games, so I use it quite a lot regardless of its effectiveness. In Battlefront 2, this system has been trimmed down, so now all you can do is either tell people to follow you, halt in their vehicle, get out of a vehicle, or go away. It's still fun gathering a bunch of guys together to go take a command post, but I do miss having all the other options available. One big problem with these games is that the AI can be a bit dim. You'll probably see many instances of allies standing right near enemies without bothering to attack them, flying around nonsensically in space, or just generally acting like a bit of a pleb. It's not enough of a bother to actively put me off, and the soldiers can be reasonably intelligent sometimes, but given the flip-floppy AI, there's not really a lot of real use for the expanded squad commands anyway. Just getting guys to follow you is pretty much always the best course of action anyway, which is probably why Battlefront 2 just had that. In Battlefront 1, you could go prone and crawl around on the floor. It's not a groundbreaking feature by any means, but I do find something very appealing about being able to just find a nice vantage point and lie down, popping off headshots from a distance. It just looks cool, and I can imagine actual snipers doing that in a fight. I'm a big fan of doing this on Naboo planes, just finding a nice grassy knoll and headshotting the native species from far away. Battlefront 2 does not let you go prone. The most you can do is crouch. Because of the way a lot of the maps are designed in the game, I guess going prone really wouldn't help all that much. I don't really see why it was removed entirely though. Instead of going prone, Battlefront 2 lets you sprint around. This consumes your new stamina meter, along with rolling and jumping. Going backwards to Battlefront 1 after 2 feels quite jarring because of this, especially if you're used to those features. You really start to feel the distance between command posts when you're on foot, especially on the more open maps like Hoth or Dune Sea, where you have to get there with a light jog instead of a sprint. Another aspect which really isn't a positive or a negative is that Battlefront 1 feels a lot harder than 2. Maybe it's just because I don't have the advantage of years of childhood experience, but while playing Battlefront 1 I had way more losses and deaths. I don't know if the AI is more deadly or matches need more skill to win, but the first game is way harder. So both games feature largely the same gameplay, but they're also missing features that the other has. Trying to decide which is better in this aspect is difficult, because there are things I really like in one game that the other lacks, and I honestly like an equal amount on both sides. Battlefront 1 has the more immersive minor gameplay features like expanded squad commands, crouching and ground to air maps. Battlefront 2 has the more quality of life updates like being able to sprint, locking onto enemies, changing units at a command post, and space battles. It also has the reward system which encourages playing well and using different weapons, which in turn can increase longevity if you want to permanently unlock the rewards. I'm going to have to give this section to Battlefront 2 because I think it just has more to offer. Its positives are more immediate, and while I do miss it, I don't think I can justify the ability to go prone as a reason why Battlefront 1 should win. Both games feature plenty of faction-based vehicles to play around and wreck havoc in. You've got your obvious picks like those wheel things for the droids, ATTEs for the clones, and ATATs for the Empire. Oh yeah, I pronounce it as ATAT, what are you going to do about it? But the games also introduce new vehicles like these rocket spamming hover tanks for the rebels, and this other hover tank for the Empire that looks like a squashed ATST. The clones get them too, and these things actually showed up in the Clone Wars, so that means they can and know if you care about that sort of thing. I don't. Battlefront 2 has the benefit of releasing after Episode 3, which means it gets the new vehicles introduced there, like the AT-RT and the Separatist wheel tanks. All of Battlefront 1's maps are ground-based, but a few of them feature starfighters you can climb into and zoom about in, either engaging opposing starfighters or going for strafing runs on the ground, if you can hit anyone. The best example of this is in Bespin Platforms, which has all these starfighters parked across numerous platforms and plenty of open air to fly around in. But, enough exposed sections in the on-foot part of the level to allow for some devious attack runs. Geonosis is another example, where you can get a bunch of clones into an LAAT and hover around harassing the droids with like three lasers at once. It's great. Vehicles that have multiple positions allow you to swap your seats on the fly, so if you'd rather let someone else take over for you while you sit in the turret then you can do so. One of the positions in a gunship is to just kind of stand there hanging on, and while it doesn't really serve any purpose, I still enjoy doing it sometimes just because I think it looks cool. The actual controls for the ships aren't that great and they can fall apart faster than the Cadbury Flake, so be careful. Battlefront 2 doesn't have any ground-to-air maps except Hoth. Instead, the game has dedicated space battle maps that feature two big capital ships duking it out. You spawn in your hangar on foot, and get to choose your fighter by simply running over to it and hoping no one else takes it first. 
But if they do and you're there close enough, then you can attempt to get out anyway. When you're in a ship and leave the hangar, you can fly around dogfighting and blowing up enemy systems with rockets, or land in an enemy hangar and take out some of their vitals from the inside. The gameplay of the starfighters themselves has been expanded, and now they have more health, better weapons, and added mobility, including the ability to do this spin, which I hear is a good trick. The standard space-based mode is Assault, where both teams race to get 180 points with different targets, offering different point rewards. Each faction has standard ships like X-Wings, more nimble ships like TIE Interceptors, and then bombers like the V-Wing? Alright. And shuttles like the LAAT or the Lambda class, which also act as mobile spawn points if we land in the enemy hangar. You can climb into a flagship's turret and shoot from there, but good luck trying to take anything out of one of those. It's a bit useless, but I kind of like it anyway. It's cool having that option to take a different role in the battle. I doubt it would ever happen, but between this and reading the Thrawn books recently, I would love an immersive Star Destroyer crew sim one day. Before the game came out, I swear I remember reading somewhere that the game would allow you to spawn on the ground and fly all the way up into space and land inside the Death Star. I used to go around telling my friends in school this, and I would like to humbly apologise for the peddling of lies I did 20 years ago. Battles are fought across the two eras, with the Republic fighting the CIS while the Rebels are up against the Empire. In most game modes, you'll have the option of picking from either of the two factions of the era. In the vanilla games, there's no era mixing available outside of a couple of specific missions in Battlefront 2, so no making the clones fight the rebels, sadly. Every faction has the same four core classes, a basic soldier who carries a rifle, pistol, and some grenades, and is generally a go-to pick when you just want to go around shooting enemies. A rocket trooper who has more health, and who is for taking down vehicles, gun emplacements, and enemies that you just want to see go boom. He also has a rocket launcher and a pistol, as well as some explosive ordnance. An engineer who is more of a support class. In Battlefront 1, their weapons varied, going from shotguns, mortar launchers, and arc casters. In Battlefront 2, this was streamlined, with all engineers now carrying a shotgun instead. I do kind of miss the variation, but the shotguns are great anyway, so I don't mind. Their secondary weapon is a fusion cutter, which can not only repair vehicles and other electronics, but also slice into enemy vehicles to commandeer them. They can chuck down health and ammo packs for both themselves and teammates to pick up, meaning they can be super self-sufficient on the field without having to rely on an ammo droid. It's always nice to see one of these guys run up and just chuck you an ammo pack. Cheers, mate. The sniper, who is all about, well, sniping, carries a long-ranged rifle that's capable of dropping most units in two body shots or one unit with a headshot, as well as a blasted pistol for close encounters. In Battlefront 1, your reticle remains on screen even when you're zoomed out, meaning you can pretty easily run around no-scoping people. Battlefront 2 removed this, meaning no-scoping isn't as feasible. Their most fun tool is this recon droid which can call in an orbital strike on a location, make it go boom. In Battlefront 2 you can just kind of blow it up instead, which isn't anywhere near as cool. Each faction has special units that you can unlock when you've earned enough points. In Battlefront 1 you have the Dark Trooper for the Imperials, Jet Trooper for the Clones, Droidica for the CIS, and Wookiee for the Rebels. These are all essentially just souped up units that come with special powers like having a jetpack or more health. The droidicas are a real pain in the ass to deal with because of course they have their shields and can cut you down in seconds with their blasters. So, the most effective method is to just throw all your grenades at them or hide behind cover just far enough that you can hit their shields but they can't hit you. I use this a lot. In Battlefront 2, each faction now has two special classes, which give you even more tools to play around with. All of the previous ones are back, so I don't need to cover those, but the new ones are as follows. An Imperial Officer for the Empire, a Commander for the Clones, the Bothan Spy for the Rebels, and the Magna Guard for the CIS. These extra classes range from being awesome to just... meh. I think it's good that they tried expanding the available units, because that's something sequels should do, but there are some duds here. The Magna Guard is particularly disappointing, because... They're cool as hell in the film, with their spinny electro staffs, but in the game they just have these weird rocket things and aren't all that useful. The clone commander is by far the best of the newcomers here, because that chain gun of theirs absolutely shreds through the enemies when it's fired up. Also, in the Battlefront 2 remaster mod, this turns them into the clone commandos, which I'm a big fan of. In Battlefront 1, heroes were unplayable, and were instead almost like a force of nature on the battlefield. That was best avoided, or something to just stand back and watch. They were super hard to kill, and engaging an enemy one was very ill-advised. In Battlefront 2, heroes were finally playable, letting you carve through corridors of rebels with Lord Vader, or swooping through the air firing rockets with Boba Fett. These guys were strong as hell, and really let players act out the power fantasies, but weren't at all invincible, as they could be taken down quite fast by a large group of enemies, all firing at once. Their mechanics weren't super deep, and mainly just consisted of mashing with their weapons, or using secondary powers to dispatch enemies. 
Since the game was more infantry focused, it's not too much of a big deal that the heroes weren't too deep or mechanically intensive. For some reason, Vader and the Emperor could fly? Like, imagine being a rebel on Hoth and just seeing Vader fly past like that. I think I'd shit myself. Battlefront 2 actually allows you to change units at any command post under your control, which allows for quick on-the-fly swapping. In Battlefront 1, you could only choose your unit at the start of the match, or when you respawn, so this was a change for the better, I think. Both games have a good range of units to choose from, and battles can play out completely differently depending on your choice of class. You can sit back on a perch with a sniper rifle and pick off enemies from a distance while your teammates capture a command post, or go full one-man army mode with an engineer. I'm going to have to side with the Battlefront 2 here, because the changes towards weapons were done better, I think. For instance, I like having the Engineer shotgun, it's great. And the Dark Trooper gets an arc caster, rather than the old shotgun thing they had. Though they're not all winners, having more options is always a good thing, and the game benefits from the extra classes. The playable heroes are just the cherry on top, because come on, who doesn't love Terug the Tante for as Vader? Battlefront 1 already had a good selection, but 2 just took it and made it better, while also expanding on it. Also, being able to swap out without respawning was a great change. Both games feature iconic planets from across the franchise that are translated into maps for you to fight in. Generally, they function quite well, with plenty of alternate routes, choke points, high ground, and pretty much all the good stuff you'd expect to see in a multiplayer map. Because Conquest is probably the main mode you'll be playing, command posts are scattered all around the maps in key locations which are pretty well spread out. If your team does well and you capture the majority of the command posts without letting the enemies have any, then matches usually result in the opposing team being forced to spawn from the last remaining post, turning the narrow maps into a bloody meat grinder. It is quite satisfying when this happens, and as you funnel the bad guys through a single corridor, they have no way of escaping. Both Battlefront 1 and 2 have a handful of maps, but Battlefront 1 tends to double up on some other planets. I'm guessing this was done because Episode 3 wasn't out yet and they wanted to pad out the action with the planets that they already did have. Battlefront 2 has more, with some dedicated space maps too, as well as every planet in Galactic Conquest potentially having a space variant if you engage fleets above it. Because Revenge of the Sith was a thing by now, you get to fight on Utapau, Mustafar, Maigito, and the Jedi Temple during the attack. Maps like Naboo, Hoth and Yavin 4, are nearly identical to the Battlefront 1 renditions, but have some updates to them to make them seem fresh for the sequel. Naboo is nighttime now, Ooh. In order to properly compare the two, I guess I'll have to go through all the maps in each game, so here we go. I love Bespin Platform. It's got a wonderful design and the backdrop is lovely. It all takes place on these big floating platforms up in the sky, that are connected by these bridges and walkways. A large majority of the action takes place around the central command post, which is where all the hottest fighting will be. The bridges leading to and from here on either side turn into a hot zone, as each side tries to push through. You could try and sneak past in a starfighter to get a bit of a sneak attack, but the turrets are on the map have a tendency of blowing ships out of the sky extremely quickly, so you gotta be extremely careful. A good mix of claustrophobic indoor sections and expansive outdoor areas. It's super ambitious, with all of these elevated walkways and ramps. But, because Battlefront 1 came out at a time when I guess they didn't have so many units on the map at once, it feels a bit empty, and there's a lot of empty space that doesn't get used. Imagine this map with like 50 troopers on each side at once, with skirmishes occurring everywhere dynamically. It would be awesome. I love how you can visit the cabin of Raging Chamber too including that big room where Vader once told Luke that he's the baby daddy. Great map that's especially fun with a jet trooper. As iconic as this planet is, I don't really enjoy playing it as a map. It's just kind of like a straight line through the woods towards the shield bunker. There's some wooden platforms of the village up in the trees on the rebel half that you can snipe from. I always have a preference towards playing as the Empire in these games, but doing so on this map just makes me miserable. The rebels have the Ewoks on their side, and these little bastards are annoying as hell, with their small bodies and non-stop projectiles. It's hard to even bloody see the rebels and Ewoks too, since they're all in green and browns which blend in with the foliage. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if the Ewoks actually counted towards the reinforcement count, but sadly they don't, and killing them honestly doesn't really do much to help your side win. This map feels really unbalanced. I guess it's accurate to the films that way though. 
The presence of the Geonosians assisting the droids makes this incredibly difficult to win as the clones, and you really have to enter pro gamer mode here to survive. I think it would probably be better to try and capture all the command posts rather than just get more kills, because like Endo, the Geonosians sadly do not count towards the droids numbers, but even capturing all the command posts proved to be a pain in the backside because they could just spawn from the Techno Union ship at the back anyway. You can destroy the Techno Union ships, but by the time you've done that, then the fight will probably be nearly over because they have so much health. So I don't know, I guess just do your best. Flying around on a gunship is cool though. If there's one Star Wars map you didn't want to screw up, it's Hoth. And luckily, it's pretty good. Lots of open space for long range engagements and vehicle action, as well as the interiors of Echo Base. Stomping around the snowfield in a Natat, one-shotting rebel scum, never stops being satisfying. You can ride around on tauntons, which is kind of nice since it's authentic, but you can't use any weapons while mounted, and they die after like two shots, so you have to be extremely careful. The main hangar of Echo Base is the main prize here, and if you capture it as the Empire, you've basically removed any threat against the Atats. The hangar can be reached either directly through the snowfields or through connecting tunnels from another command post. One look at the map and you can see it's quite an interesting layout. Most of the map is outside, taking place on these platforms connected by walkways, and from the start you have the option of tackling these command posts in any order you see fit. The raining lightning effects make this map look really atmospheric, I really like it a lot. You can even see the reflections in the floor. I don't really think too much of this map to be honest. I mean, it looks pretty under this night lighting with all the torches and stuff, but the layout and design doesn't really do anything for me. It's just pretty flat for the most part with some hills here and there and lots of Wookiees. And the Wookiees tend to help whoever the good guys are on this planet, which can make it a bit hard to win as the bad guys. But it's not as bad as Endor or Geonosis, I think. I really like this map. The water looks nice and I dig the tropical vibe. However, it does feel kind of unbalanced as the Empire and droids need to fight their way uphill to capture the opposing command posts. And the Wookiees and gun turrets along the way can make this really difficult. It can be a real slog getting up that hill, but when you do manage to break through without being blown up or sniped, it's quite satisfying. This map is quite simple. It's just a field with some ruins in it. No interiors, all indoors. I do really like it though for two main reasons. First, I find it quite relaxing to just lie down in the cool, comfortable looking grass and snipe. Mostly gun guns. It seems really pleasant. Secondly, it reminds me of Wales, where I'm from. I think I have a bit of a bias against Theed because as a kid I absolutely loathed this planet. Back then I just thought that every Star Wars planet had to be this extreme crazy biome, like a lava planet, or an ice planet, or a desert planet. Naboo is just kind of this planet of fields? With a peaceful, fancy looking city in the middle? Boring. Maybe I've carried that with me since because I've never really liked Theed that much. I don't even bother with the command post on this map. I just hop into a hover tank and go ballistic. I like to think that I cause untold amounts of property damage and destroy CEO Bibble's house or something. This map is a real fun time. With the two teams on either side, the only way to cross is through the ice caves or going the long way around. If you have any memories of this map, then you probably remember the ice caves being a bit of a meat grinder, with the two teams trying to push two against each other. As the clones, this is a really tough struggle, as if they make it out of the cave, suddenly they're faced with this big open area with turrets, vehicles, and a bad time for all involved. The droid cars in particular make this annoying because if a few of those set up in the tunnel, then you need to bring out all the big guns. I'm a big fan of playing this as the Empire because it's the only other map where you get to drive an at-at and take a trip around the side, blowing up all the enemy positions while your team fights through the ice cave. It's quite satisfying. Pushing further into the depths of Renvar, we take the fight to the Citadel with this beautiful blue skybox contrasting nicely with the white of the snow and the ruins. I've always really liked this one command post here on this dead end walkway. It's just got a nice view. Sort of reminds me of that meme thing of someone standing up against a vista with a caption just saying, man, or whatever. I really like the layout of the map as well, with all these ruins and stairs, with holes in the walls to shoot through. I love this map. The presence of the Tuscan Raiders as a constant threat towards both teams keeps you on your toes. I like zipping about on the skiff with a squad of buddies and just going on a drive-by. Just seeing a whole of guys out here in the open and turrets just looks really cool. The best part of the map is the Sarlacc pit, which pulls in any nearby fool and drags them in with a tentacle, flailing them hilariously about. <coughs> Moving away from the dunes and into the streets, we come to Mos Eisley Spaceport, where you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It's mostly just all in the streets with stairs leading to rooftops that let you hop in the turret or just rain blaster fire from above. One of the command posts is inside a cantina, that's kind of small and lame compared to the other one. And another post is in this hangar on a sail barge. I like to think that this is Jabba's sail barge and they've just stopped here in space services to get a space coaster or something. Like Endor, this is in the forest map, but with some ruins. 
A lot of it is on this big slope with these stairs and these ruins along the way, and it's fine, I'm not a huge fan of it. At the top, there's these big turret pole things that there were in the films, where you can get in and shoot down below, but because of all the trees and stuff in the way, it's hard to hit anything, really. It's an almost symmetrical space, with a command post on either opposite end of the exterior, a central command post dead in the middle, and then another command post overlooking it all from the side. Generally, that middle command post is going to be your main focus, because that gets your team firmly settled in closer to the other posts. Taking that central post is crucial, and can prove to be a real tug of war, with both teams having units flooding in from either side. There's vantage points with turrets overlooking it, so if you're standing in the open bit, you need to be very careful. If someone is up there on a turret shooting down at you, then you need to get rid of them ASAP. Battles here get really intense, and I very much enjoy it. Apparently, the rubble from the attack on the Jedi Temple during Order 66 was never cleared up, because it's still present in the main room during the Galactic Civil War, over like, what, 20 years later? One thing you'll come to notice is the Battlefront 2 does a pretty good job at recreating movie locations, and here you'll get to visit the council chambers, map room and library. Thankfully, there's no youngling corpses littered around the place. Within a murky, smelly looking swamp is where the action here takes place, and I quite like Dagobah as a map. It's got a nice mix of terrain with all the water and the land, but it's the map features that really sell it for me. Yoda's house is here, and one of the command posts is inside the Cave of Evil, complete with the ambience of that familiar asthmatic mechanical breathing. <laughs> The action down there can get pretty hectic too, with a stray grenade proving deadly. There's a ship crashed into the swamp that changes depending on the era, with either an LAAT gunship or an X-Wing being there. That is awesome. The iconic setting of Anakin and Obi-Wan's final duel is a pretty awesome basis for a map, not gonna lie mate. The scenery looks really cool with all the lava flows and mountains, as well as the random explosions of the rocket. It's a good mix of outdoor and indoor areas, though even the open paths are pretty boxed in. Most of the mining facilities rooms you remember from the film are here, like the landing pad, the outside thing, and that control room where they kicked each other on the tables. My favourite part of the map is the ability to drop the catwalks into the lava, dunking any unsuspecting souls into the hot crispy goodness. Great stuff. As far as I can tell, it's just the same feed from before, but now it's night time. The enemy AI seems a lot more aggressive here though, so... My original routine of just hopping in a tank and going nuts needs a bit of flexibility. You can fight Gungans in this map's hunt mode, but it's just not as fun because you're stuck as a super battle droid. The map where Ki Adi Mundi got gunned down by his squad is quite a good one. You've got this big circular area where a lot of the action will take place, and if one team manages to push the other far back enough, then this destroyed bridge here with plenty of holes in the ground that lead to your doom can prove to be a pretty spectacular staging ground. The final push may take place here, and it's great to see, with all these lasers and rockets flying back and forth. This version of Geonosis swaps out the Spire and raised rocky command posts for a hangar, underground caves, and this big hill over there. Personally, while I do miss the Spire and the ability to fly around in a gunship, I prefer this version because it just seems a lot more balanced. Hoth in Battlefront 2 is largely similar to his Battlefront 1 incarnation, with the Atats, large snowfields, interior base areas and tauntons. There is a new addition that makes it far better though. I truly, deeply love playing as Vader on Hoth. While I've always been more of a boot on the ground, grunt combat type of guy when it comes to these games, I absolutely adore rampaging across Hoth as the Dark Lord. In Battlefront 2, he can glide for some reason, and this lets you cross the battlefield with ease. It makes him feel like an unstoppable force of nature, like a black and crimson demon emerging from the blizzard to deliver his wrath upon the rebels. It's the same as it was before. I hate playing it as the Empire. Yellow and green. Lots of yellow and green. Maybe a bit of blue here and there. Felucia has this hazy mist over it, which makes long range engagements tricky, especially with all the foliage and tree branches. This map is infamous for the deadly Acles, which stomp around, killing troops of both sides, and can take quite a bit of punishment before going down. I do like this giant tree branch with the command post on top. It's fun driving a vehicle up there. Unfortunately, the less interesting of the two Yavin maps from Battlefront 1 was the one that got brought over here and it's pretty much the same as it was before. The place where Padme gave birth and died is an odd choice for a map, but okay. It's interesting because most of it is indoors in these tight meat grinder corridors and connecting areas, but there's a whole outdoor section that can be used to quickly access the other side of the map. Because it's outdoors on an asteroid, this means that humans can't breathe out there, so you'll have to cross it in a vehicle. Droids don't need to breathe, so guess what? They can go out there too. 
That's awesome. Battlefront 2's Kashyyyk feels like a successor to Kashyyyk Docks, with one team starting across the water and the other on an elevated position on the other end, with an uphill battle to push through. The nice tropical background of Docks seems to have been replaced with this grimmer, washed out environment that makes the battle seem a lot more dire. The beach landing area feels like something out of Normandy, with all these barricades and an uphill fight towards the inner base, which has a big door that can be lowered by destroying the switch on the other side. It's an interesting feature because until the door is opened, no vehicles can get through, which means you'll have to try and squeeze in through the sides. Same layout as last time, but now we get Yub Nub and Lapsy Knack playing in the background. Yeah, remember those songs? I'll leave it up to you to decide if you prefer their replacement songs in the special editions, but it's nice that they're included here as a reminder that they exist. This map is most notable for being the only location where you can play Hero Assault, which is basically just hero versus villains, where each team races to get 180 points. I guess it's fun for the novelty, but I don't really enjoy it very much. Camino hasn't really changed much since last time. It's still running around on these rain soaked platforms on the shiny floors. Look how shiny the floors are! Whoever polished these deserves a raise. This map has lots of tight corridors to fight through, as well as known areas from Star Wars, such as the meeting room where Vader choked that dude, the cell block, the super laser firing room, and even the rubbish compactor, which can be accessed by shooting this grate here. Brilliant. There's also walkways that you can get rid of by destroying the console, cutting off possible access to certain areas that force people to go around. C-3PO and R2D2 are just chilling in the hangar too. Definitely one of my favourite maps. Another tight indoor map, maybe the tightest of them all. It's so tight that next to a lightsaber, the shotgun is by far the most effective weapon here, with plenty of corners and choke points that are perfect to tear through with an engineer. Speaking of lightsabers, do you remember that one part in Rogue One, the part everyone loves? Well, this map did that scene over a decade earlier. You can't slam rebels into the ceiling, but carving and choking your way through the opposing team feels cathartic as hell and chucking your lightsaber through multiple rebels at once never stops being amusing. Feel the power of the dark side. This is a map where I feel like Battlefront 2 kind of missed the trick by not having the clone armor change depending on where you're fighting. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the blue 501st, but I think it would have been awesome to have the clones here decked out in the orange armor of the 212th. Aside from that, I like this map. There's this big hangar full of computer thingies, it's where Obi-Wan fought Grievous, and the rest of it is on this big incline that even has streetlights. That's nice. You know, streetlights are good, you know, they help you know where you're going when it's dark. Trying to decide which game has the better maps is hard for me. I think in terms of the actual layout and design, I have more fun in the first game with the more vertical maps like Bespin Cloud City or both Ren Vars. This is helped by that game's unique features. Maps like Genosis and Bespin platforms are helped immensely by the ability to hop in a loaded gunship and go on a rampage, which would have greatly improved Battlefront 2's outdoor map too, in my opinion. As I said earlier, I really like to just go prone on the hill for a bit and snipe from a distance, and I don't find many of Battlefront 2's maps that fun to do it in. However, I do think Battlefront 2 has better map variety, with Mustafa, Mike Ito, Felucia and Utapau being present since this game was released after episode 3. It is great being able to play through all these planets and take in the scenery, which gives a broader view of the planets in this galaxy. Battlefront 1 had to double up on some planets because I guess they didn't have anything else to work with, but then again it did have Ren Var which hasn't been in any of the films, so maybe they could have used some more EU planets? Either way, Battlefront 2 definitely has more variety. So when it comes down to it, this could honestly go either way. Whether or not more is better ultimately comes down to your own personal opinion. And since this is mine, I'm going to award this category to Battlefront 1. There's definitely more visual variety and a wider range of available maps in the sequel, but personally I prefer to have more fun, better playing maps, than just more maps that are good on their own, but not as good. Again, I love both though. Graphics wise, it's quite unfair to compare them because Battlefront 2 is of course a sequel that benefits from having more advanced visuals and character models, so I'd rather just focus on the other aspects of presentation like the UI and loading screens here. Battlefront 1's UI is this mix of oranges and blues with lots of tilted menus and holographic projections of starships. The loading screens are the sort of tactical zooming in on the planet, like you're viewing it to a console aboard a Star Destroyer or something. It's very cool. As far as the general UI in this game goes, you've got the map in the bottom left, your ammo count in the top left, and yours and your enemy's health bars up in the top right. Battlefront 2 does away with all the fancy schmancy holograms and colourful menus, and instead opts for something a bit more uniform and military-ish. Lots of greys and blacks, like something you'd see in an Imperial presentation, probably. In the console versions, the title screen has clips of the movies playing in the background, like the saying, look how cool this is, you're gonna be doing all of this, isn't that awesome? 
Not gonna lie, I find it kind of tacky looking. You go from these smooth, stylized menus that clearly had effort and type buttons in them, to just movie clips. Not really my thing. The loading screens are a still image featuring a screenshot of something happening on that map. It's quite fun playing all the different ones and seeing on the loading screens. I like to think they had fun making those and putting them in. In the campaign, it's replaced with an image of either a jet or a scout trooper, accompanied by a description of your upcoming mission. The on-screen HUD in Battlefront 2 is much better. Your ammo and health is now in the bottom left replacing the map, which is now in the top right instead. I find that having the information there is far more beneficial to me, since my eyes find it easier glancing up there. Rather than having a target's health bar share the corner with your own, it'll now be displayed at the top centre of your screen. Again, this is much easier for me to see since I'm always looking ahead anyway. Some people may prefer it in the corner because it clutters up the screen less over there, but if seeing the target info is that important to you, then I think it's best to have it somewhere easier to see, personally. So, as far as the menus go, Battlefront 1 gets the point there. I'm a big fan of all the oranges and blues and all the holographic stuff, because it gives the game more personality, when compared with the movie clips in Battlefront 2. The loading screens I'm quite torn on, because I really like both. The planet zoom-ins feel more authentic to the experience, since it's like an actual tactical view of the planet, that you could imagine feasibly taking place in universe. But, the screenshots are cool to see, and because there's more planets, it means there's a nice variety on display. I guess the novelty wears off when you've already seen them all, and it just becomes staring at a still image while you wait. Meanwhile, Battlefront 1 is actually animated and remains consistent. So, I think I'll give Battlefront 1 the point there. Battlefront 2 wins in the heads-up display department without question. Its information is easier to read, due to both its background colours and positioning, and I think blue and red work better as opposing colours for good guys and the bad guys, rather than red and green. I consider good functionality to be more important than aesthetics, so I'll have to give this one to Battlefront 2. This isn't even a fair comparison to me. All the sound effects are good, and I think there's only so much I can say there. I mean, the blasters sound like blasters, the lightsabers sound like lightsabers, and the TIE fighters still have that ear-splitting screech. I think it would be difficult to screw up the sound design by now, because it's all there. Across both games, you hear chatter from announcers, as they let you know about capturing or losing command posts, or troop numbers dropping. We've lost control of a command post. Battlefront 2 upped the chatter considerably, with both allies and enemies audibly commenting on things. And stay down! A Gungan could have finished this job. On the sides! Watch it! And just generally shouting out whatever comes to mind. If you're doing Empire vs. Rebels, then be prepared to hear a lot of Steve Bloom. Watch your fire! They're all over! Medic! Don't- It is pretty funny to me that that sentence could also apply to a certain animated show. The chatter isn't just limited to the units in the field either, even the announcers join in to hype you up. Let me tell you, nothing gets me pumped quite like an evil British guy who probably looks like this, gleefully shouting, NOTHING CAN STOP THE EMPIRE! Space battles have their own ambience too. You'll frequently hear chatter over the radio from teammates, with a filter over them that makes them sound like they're being heard over comms. Recon bomber behind you! He's trying to make the rest of us look bad! The ambience in the hangars is pretty awesome too, with a voice yelling over the speakers. Scramble reinforcements! Repeat! Scramble all reinforcements! Attention! All second stage pilots! On deck! It really adds to the charm of the game, and I can't see why anyone would dislike it, unless they think it ruins the immersion of a serious battle when they hear a one line out of nowhere. Now, obviously, both games feature the legendary Star Wars music from John Williams, but there is one key factor which pushes one of these games onto the podium. Star Wars Battlefront 2 was released a few months after Revenge of the Sith, the movie that I personally believe to have the best score out of all six films. This means that some of those tracks were brought into the game, including personal favourites like Enter Lord Vader and Anakin's Dark Deeds. Unfortunately, the best part of the song is cut out though. You know, the part where it goes dun 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 if you watched my Revenge of the Sith game review, then you'd know that the lack of that movie's music really hampered the experience for me. So you can imagine how happy I was to actually hear the music played here. The music side easily goes to Battlefront 2. Both games offer single player campaigns. In Battlefront 1 you get to pick a campaign from this menu, and these are mainly just a series of conquest battles linked together via movie clips and narration, along with special pairings like droids versus just Gungans. You'll flip between factions in these, starting as one team for a few missions, then swapping to the opposing side. Galactic Conquest has you picking a faction and aiming to conquer the galaxy, by selecting planets from this menu, 
and then attacking them in hopes of bringing it under your own control. Planets with two maps usually require you to fight them both maps in order to fully conquer it. Each planet under your control gives you a different passive bonus that you can select from before a fight, so you can employ some light strategy in order to take them over. Battlefront 2's Galactic Conquest is similar in that you can pick a faction and then try to take over the galaxy planet by planet, but the way you go about doing it is a bit different. For starters, the planets are presented on this galaxy map, with all the planets connected. I guess the hyperspace lanes or whatever. Each team takes it in turns to move on one space at a time on the map represented by these little capital ships, and when you hover over an enemy planet, you can try to attack it. If your capital ship happens to occupy the same space as an enemy capital ship, then a space battle will occur, and the victor will get to proceed towards the planet. Winning battles earns you credits, that can be used to either purchase new ships, which can be then placed over key planet, new units to play as, or power-up bonuses, such as extra health, playing as a hero, or auto turrets on command posts. Each faction has a sort of home base planet in the corner, that gives you a massive boost when conquered, so it's good to head there if you can. Battlefront 2 takes the single player offerings even further, with a full blown campaign mode that follows the legendary 501st Legion from the first deployment on Geonosis through the transition of the Empire and then concludes with the Battle of Hoth. Each mission has different objectives, and unlike Battlefront 1's campaign mode, it's not just a series of conquest matches. We'll be capturing holocrons, stopping a riot aboard the Death Star, slaughtering Jedi during Order 66, and pacifying a rebel uprising on Naboo. There's even missions with surprising pairings like having the Empire fighting a clone rebellion on Kamino, or droids on Mustafa. It's all great stuff with awesome cutscenes narrated from the POV of a 501st trooper, voiced by Timuera Morrison. The dialogue in these is super memorable, and some of it still gives me the chills. What I remember about the rise of the Empire is... is how quiet it was. During the waning hours of the Clone Wars, the 501st Legion was discreetly transferred back to Coruscant. It was a silent trip. We all knew what was about to happen, what we were about to do. Did we have any doubts? Any private, traitorous thoughts? Perhaps, but no one said a word. Not on the flight to Coruscant, not when Order 66 came down, and not when we marched into the Jedi Temple. Not a word. Because it's all from the perspective of a clone slash stormtrooper, it's interesting to see things from the view of the bad guys. In the past, we'd secretly enjoyed putting down a local insurrection or two. They kept the troops sharp and the Empire feared. But these rebels were different. They were organized. Were their reactions to the destruction of the Death Star being particularly noteworthy? Vengeance is ours, men. The spirits of our fallen brothers will sleep soundly tonight. As with the music category, this is horribly one-sided. Battlefront 2 absolutely knocks it out of the park in the single-player department. Not only is Galactic Conquest better with more choices of what you spend your credits on and in what order, but even just the existence of Rise of the Empire more than elevates it, without taking its awesome cutscenes into consideration. When it comes to deciding which game is better, there's a few different ways of looking at it. If you've been using my extremely concise and legitimate category breakdown system, then Battlefront 2 wins overall just because of numbers. Just going by the final choice in each category isn't as cut and dry though, because there were some aspects I preferred in the game that didn't win the category. Another way is just asking what you want out of Battlefront. Both of these games offer these epic battles with units running around everywhere, vehicles blowing each other up, and plenty of action throughout, but each game offers something worthwhile that the other is missing. If you want to be all tactical and crawl around, give orders, call in orbital strikes, play matches that have a mix of ground and air combat, or just try to lure people into tentacles, then Battlefront 1 excels. If you want more map variety, heroes, space battles, and a good single player offering, and a reward system, then Battlefront 2 has you covered. Personally, I think Battlefront 2 is the better overall game, since the new features it brings to the table do elevate it. It's a much more expansive experience, and while bigger doesn't always mean better, it certainly helps expand the scope of the game and gives you more toys to play around with. Battlefront 2 is still lacking key features that make the first game stand out though, so I wanted to make it clear that this isn't so one-sided and that the sequel is better than the original in most ways, but not all. I much prefer the map design and menus in the first game, and going prone with the air to ground maps could have been fantastic in Battlefront 2 if they was there, and I think it's a genuine shame that it's missing them. Even the squad commands would have been great with some better AI. It's a case of the sequel being overall better and more fun to play, but it would have been improved that bit more if it had included the missing features of the original. They should just combine Battlefront 1 and 2 with all the aspects of both and call it... What's 1 plus 2? Battlefront 3! The other possible criteria is that Battlefront 1 lets you snipe gun guns. So Battlefront 1 wins. 